This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Before we begin, I would like to take an opportunity to introduce Carissa Little. Carissa Little is the Director for the Professional Programs at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. She has been with Stanford University for 10 years. She is responsible for collaborating with Stanford faculty, industry experts, and corporate partners to develop their professional and executive programs that extend Stanford to industry. She worked in both software and education prior to coming to Stanford. Welcome, Carissa. Thank you, Stacy. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Mark Shar. Mark works for the Center for Design Research at Stanford. He is a member of the Symbiotic Project and Effect Neuroscience Lab, or SPAN Lab, at Stanford. He is a lecturer in the School of Engineering. Mark's area of research is in the intersection of design thinking and the neuroscience of choice, where he has several research projects underway. Mark comes to us with 30 years career in industry as a vice president with the Procter & Gamble Company and senior vice president and chief marketing officer with Intuit here in Silicon Valley. Please welcome Mark Shard to our webinar series. I to be, well, hi. There I am. Now I'm on. Let me uh, see if I can get my slides queued up. Here we go. And uh, as Stacy mentioned, my background uh, is a long period of uh, industry uh, with Procter & Gamble and Intuit, where we spent uh, time conceiving of and then ultimately delivering projects into the marketplace. Uh, today, I have uh, an academic career. I work uh, in the Center for Design Research here at Stanford, as well as in the SPAN Lab. Uh, which is an effective neuroscience lab. And what we're studying is choices, how people choose, how they decide, and how that affects design. Uh, when you think about design, you, uh, it, it's not unreasonable to do exactly what's shown in this cartoon, which is if you just give me the recipe, if you give me the, the cookbook approach to innovative thinking, I'll do it. Uh, but that's what's so difficult about design thinking, is that there is no cookbook, there is no recipe behind that. Yet we do know, we, we can decode what's part of design thinking and begin to understand it at least from a neurological uh, basis uh, as we break it apart. If you think about what happens in industry today, uh, and, and we use this as a definition for innovation, an idea occurs, but it isn't really valuable until you turn it into a commercial product that can be sold profitably. Now there are lots of ways to do that, and I think everybody's familiar with the concept of stage gate, which is... Uh, uh, an identified way of stepping from idea to a commercialized project, sort of step by step. And we start off with the best intentions, but more often than we would like, what ends up coming out the other end is not, um, it, it doesn't meet the, the goals and objectives we, we set for it. So we look at this and say, how can that process be amended? How can it be approved? And what role can our learning in neuroscience play in that area? This is the rough prototypical process map, if you will, for design thinking. Uh, as as uh, my friend Bill Burnett says, it, it's not written in stone, it's written on a PowerPoint, and uh, it is subject to change. But this is how we think about design thinking, which begins with uh, empathizing uh, what a potential customer may want or need, defining the project, ideating, uh, developing prototypes, and then ultimately testing those prototypes. There is iteration built in every step of this, where you iterate within a step and then ultimately between steps. And as we looked at this from a neuroscience point of view, there are really three behaviors going on here. The first one is a framing behavior. Uh, the second one is risk and understanding risk and the difference between risk and ambiguity. And the third is choice and how you choose, how you make one selection over another. Uh, that is the thinking behind design thinking. If you step back and say, what is neuroscience learning about the way in which human beings think, uh, it's broadly recognized that people have two systems of thought, uh, which, are, which are artfully named System 1 and System 2. Uh, system 1 thinking is your brain working unconsciously. Uh, and thank goodness it does, because that regulates heartbeat and breathing and all the biological functions that go on your body that happen largely and almost exclusively unconsciously. System two is what neuroscientists call conscious thought. 
That's what we may be aware of. And both of those types of thinking generate responses. Now, a neuroscientist uh, friend, David Eagleman, uh, characterizes what goes on in your brain as something like this, uh, which is a picture of the British Parliament. And if you've ever watched that on TV, you see one side vociferously arguing with the other side back and forth, uh, seemingly to no decision or no endpoint. And that's really what goes on in our brain between our unconscious thought and our conscious thought. Today we're going to focus on what happens in the conscious side of your thinking. And uh, a research scientist by the name of uh, Keith Stanovich at the um, University of Toronto has uh, has defined System 2 thinking as Type 1 and Type 2. He calls Type 1 thinking algorithmic thinking. And uh, algorithmic thinking is a process of thinking where we apply what we already know in a systematic and regular basis. Uh, it's very important to cognitive processing because if we had to reconceptualize every move of every day, uh, our, our lives would be torturous. So our brain takes shortcuts. It creates frames and it creates algorithms and it reapplies them and from that comes a response. However, every so often we encounter something that doesn't match one of our pre-existing frames uh, and it kicks us out of algorithmic thinking into what he calls type 2 or reflective thinking. Uh, this is a process where we uptake information into our working memory, hippocampus, amygdala. We use lots of different systems in our brain, and we simulate potential responses, and then ultimately we choose a response. And it's this articulation between type 1 algorithmic thinking and type 2 reflective thinking that really begins to define what we do with design thinking. The, the first perspective I'd like to talk about deals with uh, work in empathy and defining what the design problem is, and it has to do with uh, framing. Uh, Irving Goffman in the early 70s identified this as a concept, and what it is is it's a schema of interpretation, a, a collection of uh, experiences, memories, stereotypes that we use to filter all the input that comes, uh, comes through to us. You're undoubtedly familiar with the picture in the lower left-hand corner, which framed one way looks like an attractive young woman uh, turned away from the viewer, uh, and framed another way looks like an older woman uh, looking down. Uh, this, this picture was actually drawn in the late 1800s, and it's been studied quite extensively, and your brain will frame that in one of two ways, largely dependent on who you are. Not surprisingly, men tend to frame it as a young woman. Uh, women tend to frame it as an older woman. Uh, in that context, but it's your brain creating a frame around that picture. That is algorithmic thinking. That's system one thinking. And what we need to do as designers is to learn, first of all, that that frame exists, then find a way to break that frame apart, and then reassemble that frame in a different sort of way. And that's the process of reflective thinking and simulation. And along the way, as you might imagine, there are many uh, behavioral and even cognitive speed bumps. Uh, habit, uh, the way you've always done it, is a big one. But fear, fear of change and fear of differences. Uh, the environment uh, plays a significant role in how you frame problems. And then finally, group dynamics, what the people around you are saying and doing, uh, provide those kinds of problems. Uh, what we do at the, um, at the D school is we look at various techniques that help people learn to not only identify the frames they're in, but adopt new frames. Things like uh, taking a beginner's mindset, learning something new from the very beginning, or practicing ethnography, digging deeply into the, um, the behaviors that a potential consumer might be involved in. Uh, personas is something we use with young engineering students where we actually have them uh, draw pictures of and write descriptions of their potential end user as a way to really understand what's driving them and then ultimately create new frames around what a potential problem is. The, uh, oh, well here, let's stop right here because uh, I'd like to ask a question about framing and your ability to reframe in the marketplace. So uh, as you think about problems, problems you face, how difficult do you find it for you and your team to reframe those problems? So I'll turn over to Stacy and she'll conduct the poll. Well, there it is. About two-thirds of you, uh, maybe even higher, say that it's somewhat difficult. We can change, but we can change slowly. And I would say from a neurological perspective, that's absolutely correct. 
uh, we are wired not to change. We are wired to remain, um, to, to, to practice algorithmic thinking. But with help and perspective in the, in the right environment, uh, we can change. And many of us wish we could change faster in that way. And that's what, um, that, that's really what learning and training is all about, is helping us acquire the skill of being able to reframe in, in a different sort of way. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Again, back to the design thinking process. We've talked about framing. Now let's talk about risk. Uh, risk is something that cognitive neuroscience spends a lot of time thinking about, uh, particularly in the context of economics, as people make risky or, or less risky choices as they relate to, um, to, to, to economics. Uh, it's important for us to distinguish, first of all, uh, that there are different kinds of risks, and in this case, particularly risk in the context of ambiguity. Uh, we know as human beings that the choices we make lead to specific outcomes, and sometimes those outcomes are good, and some kind of, sometimes they're bad. And as our brain processes this, it really processes two kinds of risk. The first is what we will call just risk, and that's where the rules and the probability of an outcome are well-known, well-sensed, or well-understood. And uh, games of chance, gambling games, are an example of that. Our brain processes that in one sort of way. Uh, there are other kinds of risky problems we come up against, which are called ambiguous problems. That's where the rules and the probabilities of the outcome are unknown. And the picture on the lower right-hand side is a picture of the, um, the Spanish influenza uh, uh, virus, and what, uh, what that's indicative of is when situations like a pandemic occur, we don't really know how, uh, how they spread, where they'll spread, and what the implications of them uh, of, of a, uh, a virus like that might be, and that's really an ambiguous problem. In the design world, uh, that's been defined as something called a wicked problem, where essentially the parameters of the problem are not understood well enough to where you can develop any kind of solution with predictability. As it turns out, the brain processes this in very different sorts of ways. A risk, uh, which we'll say we'll call deductive reasoning. Uh, where A equals B, B equals C, and therefore A equals C, risk uh, is often calculated in the cortex, the prefrontal cortex specifically. And depending on the type of problem you're solving, it will be done asymmetrically, the right side or left side in that kind of context. Uh, ambiguity, on the other hand, is often processed in a very different kind of place. Uh, it's processed in the, in the inner brain, the, the limbic system and brain systems like the amygdala, the orbital frontal cortex, and the striatal system, which is a reward-based system, will often be recruited as you sort through ambiguous problems. Said another way, a simpler way, is that with ambiguity, emotions play a much uh, more significant role in the process than they do with, let's say, risky decisions or deductive decisions. So. In the world of design, what we find is that most of the problems are ambiguous problems. You don't have an obvious or logical solution to them. So emotions and understanding emotions becomes an important part of regulating uh, the risk and the definition of ambiguity in that process. So how do we deal with that in, let's say, the ideation stage? Uh, again, there's lots of speed bumps. Uh, it, given the fact that emotions are involved, habit and fear are important contributors as well as the environment and group dynamics. And some of the techniques that we practice are things like stoking, which is a way of um, connecting your mind and body together uh, in, in terms of uh, coming in contact with your emotions and the way in which you, you, um, you choose and think. Uh, uh, we we uh, have techniques where we can impose a constraint. So you can only use, for example, your right hand or you can only use um, uh, your hearing to solve a particular problem as a way to understand um, how you might get in touch with uh, difficult to define and ambiguous problems. Uh, we also use an interesting feedback technique called I like, I wish, and what if. Uh, this is important because as uh, feedback is provided, it takes the negative aspects out of it. So rather than criticizing someone's idea for what it lacks, you criticize someone's idea for what you like in it, uh, you frame how it might be made better as something you wish for, and then you offer suggestions in the context of what if. That simple little tool changes the dynamics of conversations around uh, ideas in a way that 
uh, takes things from being scary and ambiguous to more easily understood and risky. Uh, so let's ask a question now. What describes the risk tolerance of your innovation environment, of your innovation team? Do you feel like you live in a, um, in a risk encouraging world or a risk averse world? Well, most people are moving towards a risk accepting world and what I would uh, say is that uh, this is a bit of a trick question. Because uh, if it is risky, in other words, if you know the parameters, if you know the probabilities, if you have a good chance of estimating success or failure, uh, then you're living in a risky world. And most businesses, most innovation teams feel good about accepting a risk under that, in, uh, under that environment. The problem is many of the design challenges we face are ambiguous. Uh, you can't calculate a risk associated with it. And so that question, unfortunately, isn't here because most people are actually haven't thought about risk in terms of risk and ambiguity uh, the way you might, which is how do you deal with a situation where you really don't know um, what any outcome might lead to and how do you take those apart? And therein lies the, the, the challenge with, uh, with design. Okay, last but not least, let's turn to the third section that uh, neuroscientists are interested in, and that's choice, how we choose. And in this case, it's how you choose the idea and then how you build a prototype and learn from that prototype to drive it forward. Again, as we talked about, the choices you make lead to an outcome. It's either good or bad. And we've learned a lot of this from our distant ancestors. And in fact, I'll, I'll draw your attention to an interesting study about the Orochan people who are a, a tribal uh, hunting uh, culture in eastern Siberia. Now, most of us today don't hunt. Uh, we, we don't go out into the woods and shoot an animal. Um, uh, however, that is encoded in our DNA. Uh, it's encoded in our thought processes because it was the way in which we survived for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And so the way in which we process hunting, uh, expressed as uh, Tim Ingold did in his uh, book uh, called Lines, uh, the way we think about this is perhaps through lines. And if you think about a hunter, they start in a village, and somewhere out there is the target, our reindeer. Where exactly that is, you may not know, but you might know the general area. And the hunt ends up looking uh, like a line like this. Uh, and in this context, you can tell, because I told you it's hunting, is that it's not wandering. Uh, because at every step along the way, the hunter is sensing and they're looking. Uh, they're, in a sense, making choices and decisions about where the actual goal might be. And then, of course, once the, uh, once the hunt is concluded, uh, the objective is to bring the, the reindeer back to the village as soon as possible. And so these are two very distinctive activities that we as human beings uh, are comfortable with. And Ingold calls one of them wayfinding, and he calls the other one transport. Uh, the, the issue in today's world, particularly in innovation world, is that we're much better at transporting than we are at wayfinding. Um, our brain, and in fact our reward structures, are all about transporting. Because it isn't until you get the reindeer back to the village that you actually achieve the benefit of the hunt. So the benefit comes at the end of the transporting phase, and we are very good at prosecuting that and understanding that. We're not so good at wayfinding because wayfinding is full of lots of uncertainty, um, risk, and ambiguity. And particularly in companies, if you were to take the um, take the position of I want to spend some time just wandering, uh, oftentimes people might consider that wasteful, not a good use of talent. Another way of thinking about choices in the context of wayfinding and transporting. Uh, is in terms of mindset, uh, a convergent mindset and a divergent mindset. Uh, J.P. Guilford, an American psychologist, uh, coined this term in the 1950s as uh, two ways in which you think, two ways in which you uh, provide what he calls mental production. In a convergent mode, you're looking for the single best solution to a problem. Uh, and in a divergent mode, you're looking for a variety of solutions to a problem. And what we, we've actually done work with this in our lab, and what we find is that people who have a, a preference for convergent mindsets uh, are interested in facts. 
in fact, in a conversation uh, with uh, people about new product development, uh, they will trade facts over questions, meaning they will talk more about the facts, and after the conversation, they'll rate the facts more highly than people of a divergent mindset. And people in a divergent mindset uh, have a similar predisposition towards questions. They like questions, they introduce questions, and after the conversation, they rate the questions that were asked as being more important to the solution than the facts. And if you think about it, facts tend to close down options because the fact is a fact, and questions tend to open up problem spaces or even shift problem spaces. And what we're finding is that people have preferences for each of these kinds of thinking. Uh, the challenge we all face is that we must do both, and we do do both as, as human beings. But in a design context, uh, when you start with a problem, you go through a period of diversion, and then ultimately you have to converge because you need to get something done. So in all of us is the ability to diverge and converge. The, the trick and the challenge, of course, is to choose when to switch, when to go from a divergent mode to a convergent mode. And of course, as you're going through a project, you have many periods of divergence and convergence as you move through each one of those areas. So there's a, a chance for conflict between divergent thinkers and convergent thinkers in each area. And a lot of this has to do with the ability that people have to shift between convergent and divergent thinking. And then, of course, as I mentioned, timing. When is the right time to stop diverging and begin converging or stop converging and begin diverging. And the way we work this out in design thinking is with the concept of prototyping and testing. Uh, prototyping and building a prototype is a way to simultaneously diverge and then ultimately converge on one design. And then testing is a way to verify it and essentially kickstart the divergent process again. Uh, this is an example, uh, if you will, of, of one of our classes, uh, ME310 where students will work on the development of a commercial product, and over the course of, a three, of the three-quarter experience, they'll develop nine different prototypes that ex express this one idea. And it starts from an experience prototype that can be as open and flexible as you might imagine, all the way up to the last prototype they build in May is a reference prototype, something that can actually be produced or scaled. Uh, the challenge with prototyping, if you will, in companies is that uh, it faces several speed bumps. First of all is habit. We don't build prototypes. We build final solutions. A big one is fear of failure. Uh, prototypes, by their very nature, are designed to fail. And uh, because they do, uh, in an environment that doesn't value failure, they can be uh, fear-inducing, and so people don't build prototypes. There's also a skill to building prototypes. You have to be comfortable uh, doing things that are less than perfect, and some people don't uh, feel comfortable doing that. And then finally, in a group dynamic context, prototypes can be uh, difficult because everyone might have a different idea, and you, it puts extra um, emphasis on how you uh, resolve conflicts over, over where you go. In the D school, uh, several kinds of prototyping are taught. Um, some of them you may be familiar with, others not. The low resolution prototyping is one of the first steps, it's prototyping done with um, simple materials you'd find in a grade school, but it helps people take an idea from actually a number of synaptic um, uh, inflections to something physical, uh, even if it isn't perfect. Uh, Wizard of Oz prototyping is, uh, is a type of prototype where to the user it looks finished, but behind the scenes it's anything but. You know, it's pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. But it gives you a way to ultimately understand how uh, the user or the consumer of your product might react to it without the work of building the infrastructure to deliver it. Perhaps the most interesting prototype is something we, we do call the dark horse prototype. Uh, it is the hardest for our students to do, and it's, hard, it's the hardest for executives who come and work with us to do, and that is the prototype that takes an oblique move away from a solution, uh, that takes one of the ideas that likely won't work, from a risk perspective, definitely wouldn't work. But if it did work, would change the dynamics of the answer completely. And then building that prototype out, ultimately it fails. But almost always, some learning from that experience goes back into the final prototype. So prototyping is a big part of the culture here, and testing the prototype is, is important as well. And it, it forms the basis of how you make choices in a design context. 
So what I'd like to understand is, as you think about your own innovation team, would you think of them as being mostly convergent thinkers, mostly divergent thinkers, or a good mix of both? I'm going to give you a little more time to answer this because I am personally really interested. Well, these results actually align with our own research here. Uh, most people in the business world are convergent thinkers, as they should be, because they're valued and rewarded for delivering results. And convergent thinking most directly delivers results, and that's the environment we work in. Uh, the challenge is to get people to embrace divergent thinking and then figure out a way to manage or pivot, if you will, between convergent and divergent thinking. And that's really what, uh, what's the essence of sparking innovation on a team. And that brings you to the, the title, which is pivot thinking. And the ability to shift between different and sometimes opposing problem solution possibilities. As you've seen in this talk, uh, you see the possibility for much of this to be in opposition. Algorithmic thinking versus reflective thinking. A frame, having a pre-existing frame versus reframing. Risk assessment versus ambiguity tolerance are in opposition to each other. Convergent thinking and divergent thinking, even as something as simple as facts and questions, stand in opposition uh, to each other. In many cases, these behaviors use different neural systems. They recruit different regions of the brain uh, as, the, as you work through it. And the ability to switch between those, to pivot between those, is what def defines, as, as we call it, pivot thinking. And in the end, what we would like to think is really the heart of what is design thinking. It's knowing both sides and being able to more or less seamlessly shift between those sides. That brings me to the end of my talk here, which is the thinking behind design thinking. And you can see in our tool chest, there are lots of different experiences that explore um, the process of design thinking uh, through a lens of neuroscience, of framing, of risk versus ambiguity, and of choice in this process. So at this point, I'm more or less done. I can open it up to questions. Yeah, you know, I've actually, I'd like to join the conversation. Well, I have, oh, I'm sorry, I do have, uh, well, maybe, is this, is this the time to ask this question? Well, I, based on what you have heard here, uh, do you think you would, and this, this, by the way, is the net promoter question, so we're really interested in, you know, how likely are you to recommend the content of what you've heard today in the context of innovation to one of your friends or colleagues? How interested are you in this and, how much would you like to learn more about it? I'll give people a chance to click through that. And while people are answering that question, let me introduce myself. My name is Bill Burnett. I'm the executive director of the design program at Stanford, uh, both an undergraduate and graduate program in design, and a member of the D School, where Mark and I both teach. Um, and I wanted to ask a couple of questions, Mark, if I could, because um, there's a lot of interesting stuff you know, in, in your presentation, um, but I really want to kind of pull back a little bit and see if we can tease out some of the things that might be the most valuable. Sure. I know you've done a lot of research uh, yourself on the idea of convergent and divergent thinkers yeah. and what's a good combination for a team. We noticed that a lot of people said there's mostly convergent thinkers at my uh, in my organization. Uh, what does the research tell us? What is your opinion on what's a good mix for a team that's really trying to do uh, innovative work? Should they be mostly convergent, mostly divergent, a mix of both, and how do, how do you handle the conflict in mixing teams like that? Well, we, we, have, to, we have studied this extensively, and there are some very interesting perspectives. I'll give you the first perspective, is that everyone's profile, their preference between convergent and divergent, as well as other issues, is unique. It's really as unique as a fingerprint. Um, and that you should feel good about your your own preferences regardless of where you start out. Uh, the, the second uh, point that's important to incorporate is that people, as they, um, as they think about this, need to understand their own biases, their own frames, the frames that they bring to bear. 
Uh, the mistake that almost everyone makes, particularly the students we teach, is the belief that they are, uh, that everyone else on the team is exactly like them. And in fact, that isn't true at all. What you find out is that as you understand the people on your team, they are just as unique as you are. Some people uh, are like you and some people are different. We also know from our research is that people of various, I'll call them functions within a company, uh, bring uh, what we call uh, typical skill sets uh, to bear. So, for example, uh, we find that engineers uh, are mostly convergent thinkers, uh, although not, not exclusively, but uh, finance people tend to be convergent thinkers, manufacturing people tend to be convergent thinkers, uh, on the flip side, uh, folks that do marketing, sales, HR, they may bring more divergent skills to bear. And so that as we use the, the metaphor of a new products development team where multifunctional people are sitting around the table, there's a good bet that people will be bringing very different skills to bear on the process. Um, and, and here's what's surprising. I would like to tell you that, oh, yes, a good mix of skills makes for a better team. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not that simple as we've, as we've studied it. Uh, the first issue is you have to really understand the problem you're trying to solve. If, if you're trying to solve an inherently convergent problem, one that really demands a unique solution, like the strength of a bridge or whether the wings will stay on the, the new Airbus, you really want a convergent group of people to be thinking about that for the most part and get to the single best answer for that. Uh, so there are there are problems that necessarily uh, uh, lend themselves to a specific uh, skill set. But generally speaking, for ambiguous problems or broader described problems, having a mix of people in a team is actually a good thing. And what we found is that there are two characteristics to really making a design team who's tackling ambiguous problems uh, work. Uh, the first is a mix of skills in the team between convergent and divergent. Uh, but the second is a, is a, 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 a term called, um, if you will, social connectability, uh, w which is your ability to understand and interpret other people on your team and at the same time uh, internalize those differences and not be annoyed uh, but instead be, um, uh, be intrigued and interested in those differences. And for people who have this, what we call social sensitivity skill, uh, and teams, actually teams, if you can measure that skill amongst everyone on the team and get a, a total measure, teams that have a higher rating in social sensitivity almost universally do better on any skill uh, or any kind of uh, design test we put in front of them. So that, that helped you get a sense for how you think about that? Yeah, very much so. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're, you're right in saying that most of us think everybody's like us. But, in fact, that's not true. If I wanted to find out, am I more a convergent or divergent thinker, just as a, as a point of reference for myself so that I could you know, bring my best self to a team, are there assessment tools that I could use to figure that out? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. In fact, we use assessment tools. Uh, we can't put everyone in an fMRI scanner. It's very expensive and very slow. And so that is useful for making kind of specific scientific uh, kinds of discoveries. Uh, broadly, we, re, um, we rely on a series of what we'll call psychometric instruments. Uh, one of the primary ones is something called the uh, NEO-5 factor uh, design, which has uh, five factors that have been correlated with pretty much most of everyone's personality. And what we find is that the, um, the factors of openness uh, and, um, and compliance those two of the five factors really speak a lot towards convergent and divergent. The divergent people tend to be higher on the openness scale. Convergent people tend to be higher on the compliance scale. We also use an instrument uh, quite extensively called the Herman Brain Dominance Indicator. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the A factor, the analytic factor, it tends to be more convergent. And the D factor, um, the innovative or creative factor, tends to be more divergent. Uh, we've also looked at the uh, Curtin uh, Adaptive Innovative Index, or KAI, and in that index, uh, innovators tend to be more divergent, uh, adapters tend to be more convergent. Um, again, none of those skills are better or worse. Uh, they're certainly situational, uh, but, but we can use a series of psychometric instruments, commonly used psychometric instruments, to 
really get a sense for whether an in, where an individual is and then ultimately where a team is in that uh, context. Yeah, that's great. I think we'll, we'll, and we'll make sure that people um, that we cite those references for folks uh, when they download the, uh, the webinar. Um, I want to move to one other thing that you talked about, which it seems to be very important in design thinking. And I know we do a lot of this at the Z School. It's one of our primary methods of, of discovery and innovation, and that's prototyping. Um, you know, we, as you, as you mentioned, we use a lot of different kind of prototyping, lots of low resolution prototyping, where we leave out a lot of details and just sort of explore, you know, one or two issues of the idea. Um, and I love the term Wizard of Oz prototyping and Dark Horse prototyping. Um, it seems to it seems to me the way you describe it that prototyping um, uh, is really more about asking good questions than it is about um, you know building models of answers. I think when I when I speak with uh, teams in uh, product development R and D, particularly um, R and D teams, they think of a prototype as being the model of the thing they're going to build. Right. Or the model of the thing they're going to propose. This sounds like a very different definition. Can you talk to that a little bit? It is. Uh, and, and clearly, one of the prototypes you build is what we call the reference model prototype, which is the very last prototype, and that's something that's valuable as you uh, think about manufacturing and scaling. But there are many prototype options uh, before you get to that point. Uh, interestingly, uh, dealing with uh, both students and executives, what we find out is that um, your willingness to prototype is all, almost uh, uh, inversely correlated with your age, meaning the, the younger you are, the more willing you are to pick up Play-Doh and pipe cleaners and scissors and tape and build something. And the older that you are, uh, the more reluctant you are to do that. And yet that skill, that ability to take uh, synaptic energy, an idea, and turn it into something physical and tangible, is the is the, the kind of building block, the very basic building block of um, of design thinking, and uh, and and you can the on ramp onto that literally is as easy as uh, working with marshmallows and uh, dry spaghetti strands, uh, all the way up to uh, building things out of plywood that ultimately you're going to make out of cast aluminum. Uh, so there are th there's a whole scalable process for learning to build prototypes. But it, in the in the bottom of it is the same neurological underpinning, is that you need to uh, take the ideas you have in your head, the thoughts and feelings you have in your head, and make them tangible and real in some sort of way. Uh, and that's it, th that's uh, the bedrock of, uh, of prototyping and design thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, you know, sort of the emotional, you know, the, sort of the gut feelings you have. Um, in another uh, seminar um, we did, we talked uh, about some of Daniel Goleman's research. Daniel Goleman's the guy who sort of invented the notion of emotional intelligence. Right. Uh, he talked about a, a lawyer who had a, um, a brain tumor in a certain part of his brain and in the process of removing that tumor, they disconnected um, his prefrontal cortex from uh, areas in his uh, uh, limbic system, particularly the amygdala and the basal ganglia. Um, and the lawyer could no longer make decisions. Right, he was absolutely. He, he could. He was. Uh, his IQ tested the same. His, um, his all of his other cognitive abilities were as good or better as the speech, speech, math, speech, everything. Yeah. So. But because he'd lost the ability to valence, as uh, Goldman calls it, valence his decisions with an emotional component, um, he couldn't make even the simplest decisions. He couldn't decide when to have the next appointment with his doctor. He couldn't decide, you know, whether he was going to have you know, pizza or Chinese food tonight. He lost his job. His wife left him. He ended up living in his brother uh, brother's house uh, in a spare bedroom. Um, and what they discovered in, in that particular case, and then looking deeper, is parts of your brain that uh, control the emotional response, amygdala, limbic system, uh, basal ganglia, which are not connected to the parts of your brain which control speech and, um, and sort of logic. Um, inform you of uh, the, the emotional valence of, valences of your decisions in different ways, literally in unconscious ways that cannot be put into words. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the basal ganglia is connected directly to your stomach, to your gut. And so parts of gut feelings are literally the parts of your brain that process emotion, giving you information, but information in a way that you know is kind of unusual. Right? It's a, more of a, a feeling or a, a sense, literally a gut feeling. 
So um, I think I think it's really critical to to understand that part of what we do in design thinking and innovation is invoke the emotional side you know, of the equation. It's why we start with empathy. It's why we do a deep dive on the human need. It's why we use interviews and stories to kind of you know uh, flesh out what the real problem is. Because at the end of the day, any good in, any good design or engineering team is probably equally as good at solving a problem as any other team. If you've got smart people in your company and you say, here's the problem I want you to solve, uh, and you have enough convergent, divergent thinkers and, and good tools, you'll come up with a good solution. The problem we see over and over again is you solve the wrong problem. <laughs> right? So it's all about you problem finding. Where you really find it wrong, yeah. Yeah, where you really unlock innovation is in the reframing or problem finding section of the process. And that starts with empathy, which engages, you know, kind of the emotional intelligence as well as the facts, figures, you know, and now, one of the that can be measured. Yeah, one of the basic emotions we study is fear, and uh, fear of failure, of course, is one that w one that stands in the way of doing prototyping. There's a part of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex, which sits sort of right under the cortex, right in in front of the, the limbic system, and and we are particularly interested in that because we think that structure might form a mediating process between decisions that are fear-based and decisions that are kind of risk-based, analytically based, and that your brain uses that region as a way to decide, essentially, how am I going to solve this? Am I going to solve it as a risky problem where I know the probabilities, or am I going to solve it as an ambiguous problem where I need to engage emotion? And having people be able to understand how those two systems are triggered and how to work within those two systems, we think, from a neurological standpoint, will help people make better design decisions. So. We'll be hearing more about the orbital frontal cortex as uh, time goes on, but that's the, the, the we, we're we're learning that that may be the key regulator as to how you make these choices and move forward. Yeah, and in, in another piece of research, and, and I think we'll have to wrap up um, and uh, and move on. But another piece of research in a book called Iconoclast, uh, which is uh, written by Gregory Burns, who's a neuroscientist. Um, the findings on people who score high on psychometric uh, evaluative tests on creativity or openness, um, one of the things that seems to be um, different from them uh, than other people is that they have a unusually low fear response to novelty. Yeah. When put in a brain scanner and shown something they've never seen before, something unusual, um, we have evolved, and, and logically so, we've evolved to back up from a novelty to for our uh, flight or fight response to turn on for our amygdala to fire up and, and for us to um, be cautious of novel things. Novel things could jump out of the woods and eat us. Novel things could be dangerous. Um, it looks like people who rate highly on creativity uh, tests um, are kind of broken in that regard. They, they don't have a very high fear response to novelty. Another way of looking at this, another word we use for that is called curiosity. <laughs> Well, yeah, a fellow by the name of George Lane did some really interesting research in the 60s and 70s where he took J.P. Goford's creativity test. You know, what are how many things can you do with a brick or how many things can you do with a paper clip? And he gave it to a range of uh, subjects ranging from sort of preschoolers all the way up to people in their 40s. And they just simply counted how many things you could come up with. And it turns out that there is an expert level of this. And if you're sort of under six years old, you uh, score in the expert level category kind of 90% of the time. And if you're over 30 years old, you score in the expert area sort of 10% of the time. Uh, and the reason is, as they went back and went through it, is that when you're younger, you have um, less, you place less constraints on, uh, on things. So, for example, how many things can you do with a, a paper clip? Well, if it was made out of marshmallow or if it was 200 feet tall, uh, you could envision doing a lot of different things that uh, someone who's six years old could imagine because they don't have the frames that limit their thinking, their constraints that limit their thinking. Whereas when you're older, you say, well, paper clips aren't made of marshmallow and they're not 200 feet tall, so I can hold paper together with them. And there you are living within your frame, the f frame that served you very well, by the way, uh, up until that point, but it's not helping you essentially identify new and and uh, potentially useful uh, paths of, of design. Okay, well, um, I, you know, I think we're going to run out of time here quickly, and we've got a few things to wrap up with. So thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate that. I'm going to turn it over now to Carissa. Thanks.
Phil. And just to, to let folks know, we have uh, one or two questions that we'll be answering at the end. And uh, feel free to be asking questions online. We'll be we'll be staying in the live meeting and, and answering all those questions near the end here. Um, so just a. a I want to give you a brief overview of the Stanford Center for Professional Development. We've been delivering education to industry for over 40 years, and we have reasonable experience creating educational programs to address the career-long learning needs of professionals, managers, and executives in industry. Uh, we at Stanford are pleased to be offering the Innovation Master Series in partnership with faculty like Mark and Bill. Um, for three days, senior faculty will lead you through uh, frameworks uh, that lead to innovation and strategic leadership pioneered by the design group and the D School at Stanford. Um, it's a very hands-on workshop where you'll learn the problem-solving tools and techniques that uh, come out of those uh, the, the research um, at the design group and the D School. We designed this program for managers, business leaders, and decision makers faced with the daunting task of retooling and revitalizing their enterprises. And here you can get a sense of who might benefit from attending. We created the series because we've been hearing how organizations struggle to make innovation routine for quite some time. In today's business environment, companies continue to be challenged to implement more projects with fewer resources. Here you can see some of the key takeaways that can help you navigate uh, tomorrow's business challenges and really impact the long-term success of your organizations. Truly one of the most unique aspects of the, of the series is that you will get the opportunity to engage with a who's who lineup of uh, faculty from the Stanford Design Group and the D School. Um, they've pioneered design thinking uh, to solve today's wicked problems uh, using the techniques that you heard about from, from Mark and, and Bill today. And uh, I just want to take one moment to conduct a poll here. Um, we'd really appreciate your feedback on this. If you could give us a sense of your interest level in the Innovation Master Series. Um, and we'll just leave that open uh, while we uh, answer one or two more questions that have come in from some of the participants uh, in the webinar. Um, so, Mark, you mentioned um, that uh, social se sensitivity is something that um, is really important for teams to be aware of and thinking about. Is there a test or uh, a way to measure that that exists? Uh, there, there are. Uh, it, it's um, it, it, there are a couple of, of uh, research papers that have been written on the subject that help uh, understand uh, what are the what are the psychological d dynamics of it. it. It is not a, a single measure. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I want to correct the language test. None of these things are tests in the sense that there's a right answer or a wrong answer. We refer to them as instruments because they measure, and they measure where you are on a particular scale. So there are several instruments that measure it. Uh, for example, the HBDI C factor is a good measure of it. Uh, we've also found that some combinations, some unique uh, combinations of the um, uh, of, um, gosh, I'm blanking on it, um, Freud's, uh, the um, EMTJ, uh, what, I, 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 Myers-Briggs, Myers that's it, Myers-Briggs, I'm sorry. Some, some unique combinations of that, we've got a researcher here that's been working on what combinations of those four factors in Myers-Briggs uh, makes a different in, difference in that area. And then there are some very uh, simple and purposeful instruments that measure, in a sense, how people connect with each other uh, in, in a social sense that have been useful as measures of that. So there, there are several ways in which you can measure it, but I think once you know that it's the ability to understand, to read other people, and then to use that knowledge in a productive sort of way, uh, that just that knowledge goes a long way towards helping people uh, do a better job of that. Thank you. That's that's great. Um, and and as we mentioned, we'll be distributing some of these uh, these tools uh, for folks uh, after the webinar. Um, if you could also talk a little bit about how how do you break down the fear of failure within organizations or teams? How do you approach that? Well, it, it's interesting. The, uh, the the first way will scare the heck out of you uh, if you're already afraid is and that is to just fail. Uh, 
one of the in this ME three ten class, one of the very first exercises we do is we have students uh, build uh, paper bicycles, and uh, then we put them through a, a, a testing process that is designed to have them fail. Uh, usually, it involves water, uh, paper don't mix, and it's amazing how uh, when they begin this, their their whole goal is to build a bike that doesn't fail. And in the end, uh, they end up finding that the bikes that failed in the most spectacular ways were the ones that were most interesting and where they learned the most from. And so actually, uh, the best way to deal with failure is to fail. And uh, to yeah, we do exactly the same thing in the entry-level um, engineering class that every mechanical engineer, product design engineer at Stanford has to take called ME 101 Visual Thinking. We literally give them problems for which there are no answers. Yeah. We don't tell them that up front, of course, because it wouldn't be as much fun. Um, you have to um, uh, you have to desensitize yourself personally and then as an organization to this fear of failure. If you are afraid to fail, you will not innovate. It's not possible because innovation involves failure. Now, I'm not saying failure in the marketplace. You don't take you don't take your failures all the way to, you know, um, large scale you know product introductions. But um, if you are not explore, look look at the best model we have for innovation potentially in the in the capitalist society is the venture capital model. Uh-huh. In the venture capital model, they invest a billion dollars in a hundred companies, and five of them succeed, and they're considered, you know, really smart people for that kind of investment ratio. So if if you believe that the venture capital model succeeds, then believe that in your organization act, that you, if you act like a venture capitalist, you start many many um, projects, you prototype at a very low resolution and a very low cost, yeah. you provoke lots and lots of failures, you reward people who fail for their energy, effort, and innovation, and you you know sift through. I mean, venture capitalists don't invest you know in a C round and a D round in failed companies. Yeah, the, the the point is to fail early, fail often, and fail cheap. Um, and I, I know at, at P&G, nobody wants to have on their resume, here are the seven things I failed at. Uh, but our CEO at the time uh, started award, the failure award, and it was about the most interesting and um, unusual failure that occurred throughout the year. And, you know, it wasn't usually on some huge project that was embarrassing and financially punishing. It was on some startup project, some interesting test idea, uh, that the failure of the product actually springboarded into new ideas and new new approaches. Having a culture that encourages fail early, fail often, fail cheap, uh, is the way in which you learn to prototype and succeed. Great. And so one final question. Um, how do you approach... Um, innovating and changing business processes in, law, in large organizations as opposed to creating a new product to sell. Is there a difference? Um, well, there is and there isn't. I mean, obviously, services, the way we think about the, the world between products and services, uh, has many differences uh, in terms of their, uh, an ability to um, – um, uh, or, or how, you, how you actually go from idea to marketplace – but there are also many similarities, and the idea of being able to identify, uh, empathize what the what the customer wants, uh, ideate potential solutions, and to develop prototyping uh, that that satisfies those solutions is uh, inherent to services as much as it is products. In, in fact, I mentioned earlier the Wizard of Oz prototype. Uh, that is largely used in software prototyping, where you will develop a user interface. That is uh, that, that tests what the user sees in the context of software, but all the coding work that goes on behind it, the really heavy-duty uh, uh, lifting and moving, isn't there. In fact, some cases it's actually manipulated by humans behind the scenes just to give the feel for what the interface would look like. Uh, you can still do prototyping in a, in a service environment, and the basic principles of design thinking apply just as much to services as they do to products. Great. Thank you so much. I want to just one final thank you to Mark and Bill, um, and thank everyone for joining us today. We do plan to make a video of this presentation available, um, and we will be sending out an email to announce it to everyone when that's ready, and that's where we'll be including some of these uh, tools for you. 
Um, if, again, if you'd like to print out a PDF of today's presentation, please select the handouts icon in the top navigation bar um, and click the file that you'd like to download. There are several there and click download. Um, and thank you so much. And we'll be remaining online until all the questions in the queue have been answered. Thanks so much.